Prepare for your heartstrings to be plucked. Welcome, mere mortalites, to another round of the book reviews. I am your host, Kyron, of the Mere Mortals podcast, the Mere Mortals book reviews and the value for value. But this is the book reviews podcast where we dive deeper into the books that I'm reading in particular to give you the juicy information, to extract some themes you might not have thought about and to just dive into these books, really get a feel for what's going on and maybe uh, introduce you to some things, some that you've never heard of before. And I do have one which is probably a relatively unknown considering this is an international podcast. And this is The Harp in the South by Ruth Park. So I definitely like to focus on older classics and this definitely is an older classic. It's a classic Aussie book from 1948. It was published, it's about 225 pages in length and it probably, probably took me about six hours of reading to get through in total. It's relatively dense, the writing that you'll find on this. The, uh, I suppose, motivation, initial impression of why I came into this book was uh, I was just doing some research once upon a time of, you know, what's, what's the classic Aussie books? And uh, this was right at the top of the list. It was pretty, pretty close to the, to the top and, and consistently across a whole bunch of lists. I'd actually never heard of it before, so I really didn't know what to expect coming in. Not a book that I was forced to read in high school, which I am very, very thankful for. So it's it's pretty gnarly, man. When you when you first start reading it, I'd say within the first, oh geez, like 30 pages, there's uh, poverty, there's death, there's abuse, um, there's a hinted kidnapping or a hinted child gone missing. You don't really know what happens. Um, it's all, it all seems pretty real. It seems pretty gritty from the, from the start. Not gritty in the sense of like crime and like a fascination with it. It's more just like this, it, it just really, it, it really seems real. It really seems like, oh, okay, this could have been an actual family that, that existed. And the way the characters speak and act really conforms to what I imagine their environment and their, their life situation is very much like. So this gets us, I suppose, onto the plot and style. So it's set in 1930s Australia, in particular in the uh, Sydney uh, inner city sub suburb of Surrey Hills. And I believe at that time, this was there was a lot of poverty going on. The 1930s, Great Depression, that sort of stuff. I think it affected here in Australia as well, or or kind of coming into it, coming out of it. My, my history on, on that period is uh, pretty loose, considering it was uh, almost 100 years ago. And it, there's the Darcy family in particular that we're focusing on, which is a family of five. There's Huey Darcy. There's, I can't, I think her name's Margaret, but they all just call her mama. There is Rowie or Rowena, who was the, I'd say the main character of this book. Uh, and she's 19 years old. Her sister, Delore, who I guess is around like 12 to 11. And then grandma. And they, they form this kind of Irish family who are just living in this kind of boarding house they're renting from there, then they kind of like sublet that out to other other people. So they have a couple of neighbors around them. There's a couple of other characters, but it's really focusing on, on these, um, these five in particular. And what is it? It's basically just like, a, a book about boyfriends, about family, family relationships, drunken mishaps, arguments, and and death <laughs> over a, over a three year period. I would say it doesn't give exact dates nor times, but just judging from a couple of like pregnancies and other relationships and how things typically go, you'd say ah oh, yeah, it's about three years. So it's um very much a day in the lifestyle. It's split into twenty one chapters, but there is no kind of intro or there's no table of contents about these chapters. So they're, they're kind of unimportant. And to be honest, they just read as if they're, they're just normal. There's nothing in particular that you, you go like, oh, this chapter is distinct from this one. The actual wording, the di uh, the what's contained within the book, I'd say about a third of its dialogue between characters and then two thirds of it is explaining the situations and internal feelings. So we, de we definitely have this third person omniscient viewer that we're, we're getting to see into their lives and these characters' thoughts and feelings and things like this. So I'm gonna jump onto page 84 and 85 and Cole is going to uh, read out just a, a section from these pages so you get a feel for what the, the book is uh, about. He was almost incapable of comprehending another person's viewpoint or imagining the consequences of his deeds in another's life. So when he desired Rowie, he thought nothing of Rowie. 
He loved her only because she induced in him a sense of importance and a sequence of pleasurable sensations. Most of all, he wanted to have an experience which he could recount in lingering detail to his mates. And then skipping on a paragraph. She knew he was not the tender and masterful lover her dreams had built. He did not fit into the mold created by books and films. His words were ordinary, his body was slight and ill-formed, and his clothes were musty-smelling, rough to the feel, and ugly to look at. There was nothing admirable, romantic, or even desirable about him. Deep in her heart, Rowie knew all this, yet she fiercely drove the knowledge back before the force of her love and pity for and understanding of him. She deliberately shut her eyes to all that was weak or foolish, because in her mind, recognition of it would be disloyalty to her love for him. Yeah, so we get a, a real taste of kind of the wording, what's going on there. I actually found it rather poetic, and it's, it's some deep insights into kind of the self-delusions of love, especially that can come from, from young teenagers. And so the book really does focus on their trials, their tribulations, with its moments of joy. So overall, it's not abject objectively sad the entire time but it is a book where you kind of read it and you're just like oh that's a bit of a bummer you know your uh, your, your heartstrings do get plucked because you you do feel for these characters because they, they're not particularly bad people uh, which gets us I suppose onto some of the questions the themes what actually is derived from this book well from that earlier quote we just had then we we really see you know Tommy who is her first boyfriend her first love um he doesn't love her and Rowie in return doesn't love him. They, they both have ulterior motives. You know, he just kind of wants to have an experience which he can recount to his mates and she just enjoys the feeling of being in love. She loves being in love. And it raises some questions of like, you know, why, why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we try and protect or forgive those who are not worthy of it, who are, you know, trying to pretend this person's like this and, and things like this? In this case, in this particular one, you know, young love, young relationships, they're just so precarious and trying to figure out other people. It's the first time you're unsure. There's expectations when we see like uh, he's kind of pressuring her for sex and she's like, oh, I'm not sure if I want to. And then he's like, yeah, really kind of pressing her, but also he's too afraid to to be a man about it and, and to, like get what he wants. And it's it's very you know it's he wants sex she wants a fairy tale fairy tale and they're both relatively disappointed with the the final outcome and and they part the ways but uh not not before this causes uh, even more issues down the line and so we've got this real warped love coming from these two characters and you're like okay well you know maybe you can kind of forgive it they're, they're both really young they don't really know what's going on it's their first time but there's, there's so many instances of where it's just like, man, what is going on here? So, for example, Mama, so Rowie is is disappointed in him because he's Jewish and she's Catholic and uh, he doesn't believe in Christmas, so he doesn't give her a gift or, or he ends up giving her a gift, but it's like a wash basin and soap. Very, very disappointing. So she, so she spends all this money to buy this pretty fancy jewelry, which she then presents to her family as if he was the one who gave it to her and lies about it and the lie is discovered by her mom and then her mom's kind of proud of her for lying and trying to cover up by how much you know how uncaring and useless he is really and so you see like okay well that's that's a little bit weird you know it's it's nice but it's a twisted type of caring and love f from both of them from Rowie trying to uh, and, and the reason Rowie was trying to do this was because she didn't want her family to think bad about him. So it's it's just like this weird stuff. Um, at the end, she lies again to her, her true love to kind of cover up and it's for, for the greater good. Uh, the, I've done some book reviews of this before of, of books where it's like it's for the greater good and it never really ends up working out well. I've, I've, uh, usually the lie and the deception just makes things worse rather than better. And... This just continues out with other characters as well. Particularly, we see this with Mama and her, her husband, Huey, the, the father of, of Roy. And he's basically like an alcoholic. His abuse is off the charts. He's a good dad when he's not drunk, but he's drunk a lot of the time and will, you know, hit them around and things like this, yell at them. There's a lot of yell yelling and shouting in, th in this relationship in this book. And her self-deception, Mama has always been like, oh, you know, 
Huey, he's he's so close to being perfect. Like she has these moments where it's just like everything's good and and you know he he shows some caring, but it's got to be ten percent of the time. And then the other ninety percent, he's just like a gruff dude who's either neutral or being an asshole. And and uh, the self deception just of all these characters is is rather rather strange. And just re- idyllic love reminds me of uh, utopias. It's just <laughs> like if you're searching for a utopia, it's not going to end out well. It's uh, nice intentions, but deception comes at uh, uh, deception of reality comes at your peril which I think leads us into the next theme, which is really poverty. And a lot of times you, you don't really get a choice with this. And so there was this uh, particular section I thought on page 218, which was interesting. So I'm going to jump here and uh, Cole can explain this for us. You're beautiful, Roey. I'm not. I look like an old woman when I'm tired. You won't always be tired. We'll get out of this. Have a lovely house and a garden. Someday. They both knew that would never come. Responsibilities anchored them, for Charlie's earning capacity was very limited, and day by day their bonds to the cheap and dirty portion of the city were made stronger. Perhaps they would struggle against it in their dreams, but no more than that. There were so many other things to consider too, their shyness and awkwardness with the people of the outside world, just as though they were inhabitants of an island lapped by the roaring traffic seas of the great city. Their consciousness of poor, halting speech and inability to cope with any social standards, their tendency to shrink into and shelter within the warm, corrosive, familiar things and places, they would grow old and die in Surrey Hills, as people have been doing for five generations. Yeah, so, oh, geez, just, just a bit of brutal reality there of you, you try and do things, you, you try and escape your situation, but ah, you're not really going to escape it, you know? And, you know, uh, how does this show up in the book? You know, the knowledge that poverty runs deep and is inescapable, but how does this appear in the book? Well, I mean, every second interaction between characters is shouting and yelling. They Their ability to communicate is so, so poor. And so every interaction that they have, whether it be a minuscule thing about what's for dinner or a chore or job or something that needs to be done, it turns into a shouting match. And it's just, you you can just imagine like tensions are rising. So therefore their anxiety is going to be off the roof. Uh, And, you know, they, they, they have a certain risk tolerance for, for danger. So for example, Rowie walks home one, one night and gets severely beaten and almost dies basically. Uh, an inability to look beyond their environment when they go to certain locations such as Delore has a, a a quiz and she she wins some money from it and it's got a big presentation on a stage and things like this and the, the whole family's going there and they're just you know they stick out because they're so uncouth they stick out because they don't have just the basic knowledge of you know this is how you behave and look in public and it really gets to the question you know are these the results of poverty or characteristics that lead to it i.e is this nature or nurture were they born like you know is it internal things within them that are then making them poor poor decision making things like this or is it their environment such that they're trapped in Surrey Hills and they just do not have an opportunity to get out of it. No, even if they try and be smart like Delore did, even if they try and find a better man and a good person and things like this, their their, their economic situation is just like, no, you're going to have to stay here and to survive, you have to live in this crappy house and to live in this crappy house, you have to pay this exorbitant rent and to pay this exorbitant rent, you have to work 19 hours or like, you know, 13 hours a day at the factory to be able to provide that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, for me personally, I, I, I look more on the side of, of empathy, of, of kind of pity for these characters. Mostly I think it's circumstance and reinforced behaviors from birth. So, you know, crappy eating leads to crappy choices. And so we see this even with the, the puffing Billy, which is basically their, their way to cook food. And mama is, has to stoke it with coal. And so they just get coal on all their food, which is just like, you know, that's not going to lead to a healthy life, for example. Um, you see in some characters that they, they they don't necessarily need to be poor. So Rowie, for example, when she finds this kind of dream man of hers, she 
ends up interacting with him in a completely different way than she does with her family. So she becomes more of her normal character or her internal, which is a lot more soft-spoken, a lot more refined, and she doesn't shout or yell at him and is kind of very submissive serving of him. And it's, it's really interesting just being like, okay, I, I would say what I got from this is they're not bad people. Um, and in fact, there's certain instances where that you would expect them to show some racism or something like this, for example, against Charlie because he's got Aboriginal blood in him. And there's a couple of, you know, words in this book re referring to Asian people as chinks, to uh, black people as like niggly, things like this. And, but but you see like the characters, so they, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily bad people, even though they sometimes do some bad things it, it's it's weird it's hard to explain because you're like well doesn't that therefore mean that they're bad but I, I would just say when it comes to kind of like religion and racism and even how they behave in their internal like core they don't they're not that bad people they, they do seem to have some deep ethics that being said they do a lot of bad things and you know shouting abuse yelling uh poor decision making all of this ties up into it and so you're like Okay, well, it's got, there's got to be a bit of responsibility somewhere, you know. So, it's uh, overall you kind of look at it and you're just like, damn, that's a little bit sad. <laughs> it's not, it's not uh, particularly nice in, in that aspect. Let's jump on to the author, a couple of extra details, things like this. So, Ruth Park, uh, she was actually New Zealand born, but came to Australia uh, later in life. So, we are absolutely claiming her as our own. So, therefore, this is an Aussie classic book and it's centered on Australia. So, it makes sense. Uh, she grew up in poverty herself. So, I think a lot of the right that's reflected in the writing because it, it does come across as, as reality. It's, it's pretty gritty and knew the sting of it. Like a lot of books from this time, this had an origin in a newspaper, hence the 21 chapters I was referring to at the, the start. Normally, you can feel the serialization. You go and you're like, okay, yeah, that's a distinct stopping point into a distinct starting point. But with this one, because there was no particular plot driving it forward, it was just a day in the life. The characters would do this thing and then, you know, it's uh, summer next and they're talking about the heat and how they... Uh, wearing the wrong clothes and the old dirty clothes and then you know what's going on in her life it doesn't have that feel of a serialization of okay he wrote this in one separate chunk optimized for this portion of a newspaper that was getting uh, read out so it's got a you know it, it was like each bit had to have a a cliffhanger that sort of thing this didn't have that because because it had no plot she could just kind of write it and finish it and then write again and, and just pick off where the characters would have been a couple of months later. So it's, it's really interesting in that respect. It's probably the first book I've come across where it was serialized, but it doesn't, you, I couldn't really tell. It was only afterwards where I, I did some, doing some research and my, like, oh, interesting. That's, um, that's something I, I, I didn't particularly know. During the time when it was published, it was apparently uh, rather controversial and scandalous. You know, there's talk, talk in there of uh, abortions. There's talk in there of, um, you know, uh, sex outside of marriage, of, uh, you know, drunken behaviors, of um, inter, uh, interracial relationships, things like this. So it's, it's very much like ooh, 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 scandalous. And the people who actually published it, which I believe was Angus and Robertson, didn't want to. But because she, Ruth Park, won this contest of of the newspaper and had it published, they they um, in the newspaper they had to publish it as a book. So pretty interesting. I have no idea why it's called the Harp in the South. There's nothing in this book about harps. It's in New South Wales, so I guess that's the South portion. And maybe you could say Rowie is a is a harp. She's a beautiful, uh, delicate instrument, something like that. I don't know. I'd I'd be I'd be scrambling to to try and figure that out. So um, just an interesting little side note there. Uh, what I would just say is like the extra thing that I got from this. It really does a great job of surfacing an issue and then I guess getting a bit deeper into it. But it brings up the issue in an interesting way. And typically it's like a, an Australian classic. So uh, uh, something that's really related to Australia. So as you're reading this, you, you're going to get a good sense of what Australia at least was like. And then I think there's some things in particular which haven't really changed. So once again, Cole's going to give us a, a little explanation here from uh, page 61. He's already getting drunk. It is easy to get drunk in Australia. 
Things have been so arranged that a man can buy a bottle of musket for four and six and get madder on it than a cow and a patch of poison weed. For it did not come from any vineyard. No deep and attunable southern sun ripened its grapes. No pungent vat housed it before it was bottled. It was born of an oil well in Texas, seasoned with wine dregs, colored with raspberry syrup or beetroot juice, and even occasionally pepped up with a tan boot polish. It was easy to become a god on it, or a maniac. There are intelligent drinkers and stupid drinkers. Huey was one of the first. His intelligence told him that he was weak and without any importance in the world. He both feared and loved, and so he drank to drown it. Inarticulate, a man who had many thoughts that were no more than a nebulous, cloudy mingling of impressions, half-memories, and emotions, Huey would continually be haunted by the knowledge that he could not express. When he was half-drunk, he was possessed with an incalculable sorrow for all the piteous strivings and battlings of humanity. For what? Something better than what it had? But what it was, Huey did not know. Yeah, so... What to take from this? One, we still have goon, which is boxed wine here in Australia. It's this feral, it's like the cheap off, the cheapest off <laughs> drugs of wine you can imagine and put into box in box type form. And um, that's, that's like the, it's a really good way to get drunk and very cheap as well. So, you know, some things haven't changed <laughs> from the 1930s. Uh, a lot of other things you'll get from this book is just Aussie stuff of words, of, of names, even things like Moira, Johnny, Delore, they're, they're very old fashioned Australian names. And it's just really cool. You know, he brings up this kind of funny concept. It's like, oh, you know, getting drunk in Australia or how it's, it's got tan boot polish and stuff in it. And then, and then it's like, yeah, you know what, but there's a reason for this. And, um, you know, why does, why does Huey drink? Well, some, there's two types of people and he's, he's the first. And this continues throughout the book. It, it really shows this lonely character in a sense where, it's initially easy to put him off as, you know, the abusive alcoholic father. Uh, but then when you kind of start to realize why he drinks, you know, he drinks to uh, reduce this anxiety he feels about his poverty because he's ashamed of it. He, he drinks to uh, be able to just, you know, forget of the, the like straight up hard days of, of his working and uh, and it's just this compulsion, you know, as soon as he gets money, he wants to do good. He wants to uh, use this money to buy things for, for his family and things like this. But as soon as he gets like a little bit, it just, it slips through his hands. And once again, you know, it's his choice. He's making these decisions. But when you're looking at alcoholics and people who are addicted to substances, you know, they, I think you do have to have some pity for them and, and just go like, you know, they're not in their right mind and even when you know he has good intentions but this consuming aspect of him just makes him go and and um do things that all like all the way is just like it's, it's just a bit sad <laughs> to be honest so let's just go into my summary similar book maybe some recommendations uh, it's, it's just a really solid read although sad it didn't leave me super depressed like some other books have in the past uh, probably because the ending was happy. Yeah, relatively. <laughs> and no matter, I, I think due to this kind of like day in the life and it would just roll on from one scene to the next, even when they had really bad passages, even when, you know, grandma died or when, uh, Rowie has like this, you know, a beating slash abortion slash, you know, traumatic event happened to her there there's always a, a a bit of a glimmer of hope or there's always it, it it just transforms and it's not like it just ends on a on a brutal cliffhanger of you know he's trapped in the cell with no hope or anything it's like no it just continues on and so uh it didn't although not happy it's it's not sad it doesn't linger in the sadness it, it kind of goes on so in fact even the worst old doldrums would would have some positive shortly afterwards i think there's great insight into a different type of life i hope a life i'll never have to experience i hope that you know most people unfortunately will experience the the poverty and the decision making that that results from that but um at least here in australia most people aren't in that position anymore but there's there's still some who are and it is um it's it's very sad it's very sad in that respect um po poverty is just brutal just brutal it makes you you know the pain the suffering and it makes there's a, there's a cyclical nature to it, which is 
uh, very hard to break out of and um, yeah it does make you sad so overall I'm going to give the harp in the south by Ruth Park a very solid 7 out of 10 definitely would would uh, recommend checking out if you want some Australian history um, if you're if you're feeling a bit sad maybe don't read it maybe leave it for another time in terms of similar books I've done a book review of uh, My Brother Jack by George Johnston. I think that gives a relatively similar similar experience in some ways. I think that book was f uh, in Melbourne, if I recall co correctly. It was dealing with some themes of war, but there was a lot of poverty and uh, of characters kind of living in these shit places and then having to go to work and and trying to find a little bit of love, trying to find some connection with other people. It's just a very different time compared to now when we've got our phones and digital connections and, and all these sorts of things. So very different in, in that respect. Uh, and finally enough, my brother Jack, when I was reading it, I had in this vision of my mind, it was very much a um, kind of like a black and white type scenario. It, it seemed, um, it, it, it very much seemed like it was just a, uh, uh, yeah, this, this kind of black and white, whereas here this was a more sepia um, version. So, yeah, in interesting in that respect. Um, what I would just say is, yeah, check out that. Probably also due to the non-judgmental nature of the characters. There's nothing that can really, really be um, done with that or changed with that. Um, I'm going to jump onto my Boostergram lounge here as well. I believe there might be some audio issues with the video, so... Uh, I might have to re-upload this later, splice them in together or something. Um, uh, it was working fine at the start, but things change apparently with uh, with all of these things. So uh, the Boostergram Lounge is a section where I, I thank people for contributing to the podcast. I saw Sam Sethi last week from PodFans was uh, contributing in. Very much thankful for the a lot of streaming. I sent a test boost out to Cole. I believe he sent one in as well just to test out the... Uh, uh, the splits, because I put him in as a 10% split. So every time that uh, you send a message through to the, this podcast, to, the, to this episode, I should say, 10% um, of that will go to Cole, which is uh, very cool. And I very much thank Cole for, for all of he's done. Uh, you see on your screen here now as well, if you want to contribute, um, there's actually a, and, and know what a Satoshi is. So this is a value for value podcast. I just ask that you, uh, if you've gotten some value from this, you, you contribute that back. As many different ways of doing this, but and if you go to meermortalspodcast.com slash support, you'll see how you can send in a boostergram within a podcasting app or via via a a desktop link or something like that. And that is a way of um, being able to contribute something back to the show monetarily form. And I, I'll, I like to read those out. I do want to give a shout out to a character who was popping up in our, our comments recently as well. It was pretty funny because he left, geez, how many comments? It, was, it must have been like 10 plus on various different uh, book reviews. It was Psyche Hacker 6914. <laughs> and so yeah it was really cool uh, just having someone interacting in the comments i really do love that this is the youtube comments i should um talk about in particular and yeah that's that's really cool i do appreciate uh, people sending messages in and um and adding something so that there is a, a bit of discussion going on down the bottom there so very much thank you my friend and i if i miss any of them you know that it's, I, I try my best to get to all of them but sometimes youtube does weird things and um yeah i uh it, that's just the way it goes so i'm gonna leave it up here and just say this is a value for value podcast so very much thank you for um uh everyone who's contributed in time talent and treasure share this show with someone who you think will uh, benefit from it if you have a recommendation a talent of things you think i'll enjoy please uh list that out to me send uh, send that in via the social uh, any of the social links or reach out directly with a boost gram or things like this. And then finally, treasure, you know, send in a boost. There's also a PayPal. So if you click on the PayPal link, you can uh, do send some money in whatever, however much value you get from this. And uh, that all goes towards to, you know, the hosting, contributing and, you know, my time and effort and things like this. So we're going to leave it there for today. I thank you every, everyone very much for um, tuning in, joining in. If there's any audio issues or video issues, I'll look at still a work in progress, still trying to get those good. And um, yeah, I'll leave it there for today. Next book coming up will be The Three Body Problem by, I think his name is Xi Jin Liu. I'm, I, I will need to research how to pronounce that. But uh, a little bit of sci-fi coming up for you. So we're going to leave it there for today. Thank you, everyone. Ciao for now. Kyron, out. <laughs>